let me refer to the latest strike action by SAIFSA, for instance, um, where the auto industry and this were components and still, still in particular in the steel and engineering subsector. Now, we were not directly affected. We are the ultimate uh, OEM that makes cars would want to buy uh, some of the supplies that are within this uh, uh, particular um, um, forum. If they are out for a week or two or three, at least we've got up, uh, up, you know, notice up front and we're able to plan accordingly, get some parts, stockpile and make sure that we can continue production. The cars that we make, maybe there are no leather seats in there. Well, let, let me not be specific in this case because leather was not involved. Maybe some uh, a steel parts that goes into the vehicles that we've made and we make uh, the T6, the Ford Ranger, Wild Track and so forth. Very nice truck in, in Silverton. If I can have that steel part in there, then I'm out for, the, for, the, for that period. Why that is significant is that eventually I have customers who've ordered this Ranger. I've got to export 248 countries uh, across the world, um, South Africa being one of them, but there's 147 others. Uh, in this case alone, and, and I'll take the example of last year where we were out for seven weeks, I had 2,000 Rangers that missed the boat because they could not be put on that boat, and that meant that you have 2,000 customers sitting in China, sitting in uh, Dubai, sitting in Miami, who couldn't get delivery of their vehicles. This customer is going to go elsewhere because he's saying, but I cannot rely on these people to produce this thing that I've, I've ordered. So that's the impact that it begins to have. And I thought I'd answer that, that question up front. You say that eventually for all the OEMs that you'll speak to, they'll tell you, you know, we recognize the right to strike uh, and we appreciate that people should, when they're unhappy, say certain, certain things and engage us. And as uh, Vuyo has acknowledged, it's very correct, and, and, and Vuyo, thanks for that. We do have strong relationships with the unions. We engage them. They know what, what's at stake. But some of the issues are social issues. As you've heard, you know, the triple, the threats of, you know, unemployment, of poverty, and of uh, inequality. And eventually what happens is that those social issues are transformed into the workplace because that's where people come from. And that some of the issues of, listen, I want a, a decent wage. I want to be able to have a, 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 a be able to get, come to work and not just, you know, uh, uh, pay myself, you know, the salary that I get, I put into transport to come to work. I need to be able to feed my, my family. So that's the concern, we understand. However, that means at the end of the day, the people who pay your salary are the customers, the ones that have just missed their orders. And so if they don't get their, their orders, they're not going to buy the vehicles. They're going to go elsewhere where the cars can be delivered. And that is what we mean when we say we need to be competitive. That means being able to be reliable. Your customers can rely on you to know that I've got this order that I've placed and that you will deliver it on time. If they cannot rely on that, they'll go to the next best person who can. So that is the impact that you'll find from a Toyota, from a Ford, from a GM, and that will be the issues right, right around there. Now, you mentioned the issue of incentives, and I took a long roundabout way of responding to that. When you look at production in South Africa because of various other things, and I can mention just quickly logistics costs. If you draw the map of Africa, the 148 countries that I mentioned are based in Europe, are based all over the world. So you are at the southernmost tip of a continent, and the costs the cost that you're going to take from transporting that unit that you want to transport to Spain to, is going to cost you that much more because you're coming from a very, you're far off. You're, you know, you're almost you know, at the other end of where the markets are. So those costs are important. Uh, other costs will be cargo dues, what Transnet is charging me in order to move these things at the port and so forth. There'll be electricity costs. Those are things that because of the reality of the country that we're in, security of tenure of power, electricity and so forth, there's nothing much that you can do about. You can negotiate, you can try to get best prices. The one thing that is in the equation, which is variable, is the labor component, because it's also the other, I mentioned logistics, electricity, so labor also gets in there. And if you cannot, if, if with those problems that you're already having, cargo use logistics, and then you have a labor situation where you cannot reliably have people to work, then you've got a problem, because the other OEMs, and by the way, as Ford, when I have a product that I need to, com to, to, to make in South Africa to manufacture or assemble, the T6, the Ranger that you all see, and thank you very much, you all love, because we, we're selling them like hotcakes. The, the, the challenge is that with that vehicle is, for me to make the next model Ranger, I have to compete with all the other four countries where they also want production. They want to manufacture those cars from within their own countries. Which means if they can solution logistics and they are closer to the market, or the electricity supply is good, and their labor is cheaper. The people who make the ultimate decision, my bosses in Dearborn are going to say, well, we think South Africa is out of the question. We're not going to take it there. 
because you've got these other issues, including labor. You can't, we can't even rely on you to produce over and beyond the fact that you're furthest from the market and so forth. So that is the equation that is in the mind of the potential investor eventually. Our own bosses that say, well, tough. Thailand is competing with you. The Ford plant in Thailand wants to produce the T6. We will put it in Thailand instead of South Africa because otherwise you're not able to. So those are the realities that we're dealing with. Now, still answering the question of incentives. We're, we're able to solution all of that and you can get your, your ducks in a row and all of those that I've mentioned because the government, luckily for South Africa, has the APDP, the MIDP previously that uh, we referred to, which incentivizes you to manufacture here if you produce 50,000 vehicles per annum. However, those inten and, and by the way, let me ad admit upfront, those incentives go a long way in addressing those costs that I mentioned, logistics and so forth and so forth. In fact, when I compare with, with Thailand or India or any other place, the incentives are the only reason that some of our parent companies actually bring manufacturing here. Now, the, the thing is, incentives are a policy of government, which also is in transition, is moving, and is asking the questions, am I getting my value for this? If the government moves with incentives, then there's not going to be any production there, because that's the only thing that's actually keeping you there. So that's the equation that you're playing with. And, and so that is why we welcome the incentives. That's why we're saying those incentives must uh, stay because that's the only things that are actually making us competitive. Otherwise, you're not competing with your other uh, sister companies on the, same, on the same footing, given the other challenges.